The last five weeks, we've been looking at um, the issue of identity. And uh, you'll notice that Tim in his announcement said we're halfway through. Well, in fact, we're finished. <laughs> this is the last one that we'll be doing on identity and moving on to the next topic. And in order to conclude this series of messages, I want to go back to what we started with. And one of the questions that Tim asked uh, at the very beginning, you may recall, was, Who are you, God? And what he, in fact, was doing was echoing the words of Moses. Moses uh, remarkably has these extraordinary encounters with God, first of all at the burning bush, then later on in uh, Exodus 33, 34, he has this whole extraordinary conversation. And he asked this poignant question, which I think is a question that we have asked over our lives perhaps even before we're born again and subsequent to being saved we've asked the question who are you because God in himself is in a sense in a sense unknowable because he's much greater than our minds can take in and so this question is something that's very important for us to ask and I want to consider it again in, in closing off this this series and the response that God gave to Moses was an interesting response. It was really him giving to him and then to the people of God through him his covenant name by which he would be known through the dispensation of the Old Testament. Now he had different names associated with different aspects of his nature but this particular name Yahweh or the I Am was this covenant name which he was to be known by. Now it's rather an enigmatic kind of concept, an enigmatic name somewhat hard to understand but fundamentally it was really talking to or talking about his greatness. J.I. Packer writes in his book Knowing God that this name spoke to Israel as a nation of what God was in himself rather than what rather than of what he would become. Uh, let me just say that again I'm just going to slow down I've been driving and preaching Lord, just bless him now, I pray. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Jai Packer writes in his book, Knowing God, that this name spoke to Israel as a nation of what God was in himself rather than of what he would be in relation to them. So this name was very much about God himself. It speaks really about his self-existence, his sovereignty. It really pointed to or, or encapsulated, if you like, the awesome nature of his being. And as we know that during that dispensation in which this name was spoken, and from this time, there was a very different relationship that the people of God had with God than we have today. In that particular dispensation, the people of God fundamentally were to keep, keep their distance, a respectful distance from God. It wasn't that he was impersonal. It was just the nature of that dispensation. And the relationship which the people of God had then was really a vicarious relationship in that it was through someone else. And they, the people of God had their relationship to God and with God through the priesthood and through the prophets, to some degree through the kings and through the scriptures that they had then and the types and symbols that they contain alluding to God. Now when we come to the New Testament, we see a major shift. And Jesus, when he comes on the scene introduces to us a completely different name for God. It is not at the introduction of this name that God had changed in any way, shape or form. He was still God. He was still Yahweh. He was still the I am or I will be. He hadn't changed because his nature doesn't change. But rather he was changing the way he was going to express himself to the people of God. And so the name that Jesus introduced was the name, seems like a title, but it's the name Father. 
You may recall in Luke 11 where Jesus begins to talk about how you should pray. He says, when you pray, pray like this, our Father, which art in heaven, and so on. He introduces this whole different dynamic, this whole different understanding to the people of God and subsequently to the people who become the people of God through the work of the cross. It's a name that's full of promise. It's a name that's full of extraordinary things which I hope to explore with you for a minute or two. I've just got to see what the... Yeah, there's the clock over there. I'd hate to go over, wouldn't you? <clears throat> this name speaks of himself, but also speaks inclusively of us. Now, if there's a father, by definition, there must be children. I want to look at this whole business of children, the children of God, the sons and daughters in a minute. But just before I do that, I want to just for a few minutes explore what God is like. What is Father like? Now, you will have explored this on your own, of course. You would have been uh, in your studying and your readings and hearing sermons and so forth. You would have heard, have heard what I'm about to say, but I don't think, I think it hurts us to have a little revision from time to time. So let me just throw out some seed to you, which is all I can do this morning. Throw out some seed to you for your consideration and evaluation. God is omnipresent. Now, we could talk about that for weeks, but God is omnipresent. It simply means that he is everywhere at all times. Now, could we go to the furthest reaches of the universe, wherever that is, we would find God there in his entirety. Not a part of God, not some here, some there. Whatever God is, whoever God is, he is there at the furthest reaches of the universe in his entirety. His whole being is present there. Yet, at the same time, his whole being and who he is is here with us this morning. These are mysteries. God is everywhere at all times. He is omniscient, meaning the Father has complete and perfect knowledge of all things, including the past, the present, the future, everything both actual and potential. My dad was a good dad for the most part. He had limited knowledge. And from time to time, he would get it wrong. I would often tell him that, but it didn't help. From time to time, he'd get it wrong. But you see, the Father, being omniscient in his being, cannot and will not ever get it wrong. I'm describing our Father. He's omnipotent, meaning that he is all-powerful and is able to do all that he wills. Everything that God has conceived, he is able to bring to pass. Such is the power of our Father. I have some great ideas, but don't have the capacity nor the ability to do some of those things. Never is that true of God. He is immutable. He doesn't change in his essence. He doesn't change in his character. He doesn't change in his purpose or his knowledge. But in that, he still responds to people's prayers. He is eternal. There never has been a moment when he wasn't in existence. Now, you know this, but I'm describing our Father. He is not bound by time, but he works within time. 
He's sovereign. He is supreme in rule and authority over all things. Yet within that, he allows human freedom. Choice. He's holy. He's absolutely separate from evil. He's love and loving. He's truth. Not simply does he speak truth, he is innately truth. He's righteous. He doesn't conform to a standard of right and wrong. He is the standard of right and wrong. And he's merciful. He ministers out from himself to those who are undeserving. It's called grace, which Nikki mentioned last week. And I could go on and on and on and on and on and on in describing the wonder, the majesty, the greatness of our Father. He is indescribably great. Just for a second, let me pull out one of those attributes, and that is the attribute of love. Because it is this overarching quality that's intrinsic in God. And it's intrinsic in the name that he's chosen to use, Father. It is this love that moved him in the first place to reach out to us undeserving human beings and through Christ draw us to himself. It's his love flowing from his grace that caused him to send Jesus to ransom us and to reconcile us to himself. And it's not because there was anything in us that caused or compelled him to do that. It was purely by free choice coming forth from his great love. Subsequent to our responding to this love, subsequent to our responding to the message of the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit in us, we become born again. And then having been born again, there is this other wonderful process that takes place. And that process has a name, and that name is adoption. Ephesians 1.5 says this in the New Living Translation, second edition. <laughs> you got this the first. This the... God decided in advance, or advance, I don't know, to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. You see what it says up there? The next sentence is an extraordinary sentence. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure he wanted to he desired to not compelled to but he wanted to and he desired to to go out and search for you and I and in finding us draw us into his family through adoption to the work of Calvary and subsequently adoption and it gave him great pleasure now that's the sentence isn't it it gave him and gives him great pleasure. Romans 8, 15 to 16, same translation. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you have received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. It simply means Father, dear Father. It's an incredibly intimate and personal term that Jesus had with the Father. Jesus in his communication with the Father would say, Abba. And now that Father is our Father and we with him can stand and say, Abba Father. Father, dear Father. The business of adoption in the ancient times, particularly in the Roman Empire, was really different than the way we understand adoption in our world. We generally think of adoption as taking into our homes a, a baby or a small child, generally speaking. 
Whereas in the Roman era, the, the person that was adopted was usually a young adult or an adult. And that person was chosen because of the virtues that that person displayed. It was generally a family who didn't have a kid and they wanted to adopt this person so that they could carry on the name, which was very significant business back then. And so they were specifically chosen, chosen on purpose, and chosen because of something that was in their character that was desirable to those who were adopting that person. And of course, when they were brought into the family, they were given all the rights and the privilege that was associated with that family. And they then became an heir of all that that family possessed. That was Paul's frame of reference. We've been adopted by God. We've been chosen on purpose by God. He has overlooked the issue of our sin because he didn't choose us because we're virtuous. He chose us, as I said before, because he chose us, rather because he chose to, because he loved us. Very personal, very deliberate, and very wonderful. John 1.12 says this, But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Gave the right to become children of God. It's a privilege to have been chosen to be a son or a daughter of the Most High God. 2 Corinthians 6.18 says, And I will be your father, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. It was the Father's love and grace and that alone that moved him to grant us sonship and a word I'm going to make up, daughtership or daughtership and sonship. What a high privilege. What a high status we live under. And furthermore, he gave us all the rights and the privileges and the inheritance that are associated with being a member of a family. Just checking the time. So I better hurry. Okay? You can talk to me, it's all good. As long as it's nice. Through the Father's adoption of us, we are considered family. Does that move you? Is that important to you? Do, do, do we fully understand the weight of this, the enormity of this, the, how extraordinary it is that we are no longer outcasts, but members of God's family? There's another interesting thing I want to point out to you just briefly. Not only are we sons and daughters, but we have an extraordinary elder brother. Correct. This is what the scripture says about that. In John 20, 17, don't cling to me, Jesus said. For I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to your God and my God. This is Jesus speaking in the upper room before the cross, speaking through the cross concerning you and I and all the millions of people that have responded to the message. But go find my brothers. In that instance, it was the disciples. But go find my brothers and tell them and telling us, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. For Romans 8, 29, for God knew his people in advance and chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. 
You know, we can talk about Jesus being our elder brother, as R.T. Kendall puts it in one of his books. It sounds lovely, and we go, yeah, mm, whatever. And we've heard it, and we, we sort of sometimes don't think, well, that's a bit disrespectful because he is the second person of the Trinity. He's the Lord. He's the one through whom everything was created, etc., etc. But it's truth. It's Bible truth that this extraordinary person called the Lord Jesus Christ is in truth our elder brother who stands up for us, as it were, at the right hand of the Father, making intercession. Our elder brother is significant to us. We are a part of a phenomenal family. The Father being the head and Jesus being the elder brother. There's something else, too, I'd like to share with you. Not only are we children... Not only is Jesus our elder brother, but we are now, because of all that's happened, joint heirs with Christ. Heirs of God and joint heirs, or the modern translation says co-heirs. Sometimes I get stuck in the King James because I'm a bit old. But it was a very difficult translation. But anyway, we won't go there. Heirs of God. So that means, like it meant in the, the Roman family, everything that was theirs is ours. Was theirs, the father's was theirs. Everything the father, our father is, is ours. Everything that belongs to Jesus, everything that belongs to the father, belongs to us. So often we live down from that rather than up from that. We don't fully understand the wonder of what is available to us as sons and daughters. There is no limitation. If we understand this, this is so simple, but if we understand the, the, the power of this and live under that power, it's life-changing. If we can understand the high privilege of us being sons and daughters of God, if we can understand the high privilege of us being the younger brothers, as it were, of Jesus, if we can understand the phenomenal uh, thing that is that we are joint heirs of Christ, if we can understand that when the devil comes to lie to you, when the enemy of your hearts comes to try and steal from you or accuse you or drag something up out of your past, remember who you are. Remember who you are. You're not what you were. You're not what the enemy says you are. And Tim says we are in his sermon. We are who he says we are. It's true. And who we are is a son and daughter of the Most High God with enormous privileges and responsibilities. In order just to get some insight into how wonderful this is, this business of being a son, the best way I've found is to look at the relationship between Jesus and the Father. If I want to know what it's like to be a son of God, then I look at the Son of God and understand how they function together, how they communicate, what goes on between them. It gives me a wonderful insight and help. The standing, the standing that Jesus has with the Father belongs to us. The security that Jesus had when he walked on earth and the security that Jesus has now is ours. Can you for a moment imagine God saying to Jesus, the son, look, you know, I'm done. Just, just, no. If Jesus will not treat the father like, the son like this, if the father will not treat Jesus like that, he will not treat us like that because we are sons and daughters. 
What else is there in the relationship between Jesus and the Father? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in his moment of agony cried out, Abba, Father, there is, a, there is something in us by the Spirit that when we are, find ourselves in a difficult spot, we can stand before God and deep calling unto deep, begin to cry out to him with words that are coming from the depths of our spirit, knowing that God will hear us. In this instance, he cried that the thing would pass, not thy will, but thine be done. But if you go to Hebrews 5.17, it says he raised him up because of his, his great cryings and tears. He will answer you, friends. The same relationship, the same prayer life, the same whatever that Jesus had is available to us today because of our Father. The security he had the cry, the prayer that he had, the closeness he had, the affection that he had and has, the tenderness, the protection, the guidance, the guidance the son experienced and experiences is ours. And there is this extraordinary scripture that I want to speak to you and read to you. I and them and you and me. John 17, 23. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. If you forget everything I say, and I know that's imminently possible, if you forget, please don't forget this. Don't forget this. That he loves you. And it, in our society, it's become a cliché. Love is associated with a drink. It's cheapened. But the thing is, it's still truth. God loves you with exactly the same kind of love. The exactly the same intensity of love. The absolute unconditional nature of that love as he loved Jesus. I find that strange. I don't know, dumbfounding. I've read it hundreds of times and I continue to read it and I still get shocked by it and I still get taken aback by it because I know my failings and I know the stuff that's in my heart. So I struggle with it, but it's still true. He loves you. He loves you. He loves me with the same love as he loved Jesus. That's pretty profound. It's great that it's true. We started out with the question, who are you? Tim, Pastor Tim echoing the voice of Moses, who are you, God? And God responded, I am Yahweh, the Lord. When we ask the question today, who are you, God? He replies, I am your father. And by implication, you are my son and you are my daughter. There is nothing higher than that. Our society searches for status and strives for status. Friends, this is status of the highest kind. I want to read you something in conclusion. And if Hayden, young Hayden, helped me with this, we just took a couple of pages out of J.O. Packer's book, Knowing God. And I'll destroy it after I finish it. You think I'm plagiarizing, whatever. But we'll put his name up there so you know I'm not pinching it. I want to read this to you just in closing. If you've never read that book, Knowing God by J.O. Packer, can I recommend it to you? I don't get any royalties. I'm just recommending it to you. We're going to throw this up. It's up. Can you read that? It's small, isn't it? Would you like to come up on the platform so you can read it? <laughs> well, I'll read it to you, shall I? Do I know my real identity? My own real destiny? I am a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer. My Savior is my brother. 
And every Christian is my brother or sister too. Say it over and over to yourself first thing in the morning and last thing at night. As you wait for the bus, any time when your mind is free and ask that you may be enabled to live as ones who know it is all utterly and completely true. For this is the secret, the Christian secret of a happy life. Yes, certainly. But we have something both higher and profounder to say. This is the Christian secret of a Christian life and of a God-honoring life. And these are the aspects of the situation that really matter. May this secret become fully yours and fully mine. To help us realize more adequately adequately who and what, as children of God we are and are called to be, here are some questions by which we would do well to examine ourselves again and again. Do I understand my adoption? Do I value it? Do I daily remind myself of my privilege as a child of God? Have I sought fully full assurance of my adoption? Do I daily dwell on the love of God to me? Do I treat God as my Father in heaven, loving, honoring, and obeying Him, seeking and welcoming His fellowship, and try in everything to please Him as human parents would want their child to do? Do I think of Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, as my brother too? Bearing to me not only a divine authority, but also a divine human sympathy. Do I, daily, do I think daily how close he is to me, how completely he understands me, and how much as my kinsman redeemer he cares for me? Have I learned to hate the things that displease my father? Am I sensitive to the evil things to which He is sensitive. Do I make a point of avoiding them lest I grieve him? Do I look forward daily to that great family occasion when the children of God will finally gather in heaven before the throne of their father and of the lamb and their brother and their Lord? Have I felt the thrill of this hope? Do I love my Christian brothers and sisters with whom I live day by day in a way that I shall not be ashamed of when in heaven as I think back over it? Am I proud of my father and of his family to which by his grace I belong? Does the family likeness appear in me? If not, why not? And God humble us and God instruct us. God make us his own true children. Friends, I've just thrown some seed out to you this morning. If the team would come up, please. It's impossible in, in a short period of time to fully to, to unpack the wonder of, of all this stuff. And I feel so inadequate within myself to, to speak to you about something so phenomenal and so great. But nevertheless, By the Holy Spirit, I trust that something of what has been said and read today will find home in your heart and with the watering of the Spirit grow into something powerful and strong. Would you stand with me, please? And let's commit this to God as the rain comes down. Outside. Inside. Heavenly Father, we stand in your most holy presence today. And we recognize again what a privilege it is to be able to do so. We thank you that because of your love and grace, you went and searched for us and found us and gathered us and brought us into your great family of which you are the father and the head. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for going before us And going on our behalf to the cross. And we honor you for that. And are so grateful and so blessed and so amazed that you are our elder brother. We thank you, Father, that you are our Father. And we glorify you this morning. 
May the truth of this fact impact our lives so profoundly that we'll live at a higher plane as sons and daughters of the living God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.